Hey folks, the holiday season has arrived. Why not treat yourself to a gift and get a Stitcher premium subscription? You hear me? For their Black Friday sale, you can get 50% off your first payment when you go to stitcher.com slash premium and use promo code WTF50. That's only seventeen fifty for an entire year of Stitcher Premium. Binge more than 800 episodes from the WTF archives, along with all our bonus episodes, the Mark and Tom show, plus their Stitcher original shows, exclusive bonus episodes of your favorite podcasts, and hundreds of stand-up comedy albums. Just go to Stitcher.com slash premium and use promo code WTF50. That's WTF50 for 50% off your first payment. We're also sponsored by Spotify. Whatever kind of podcast you're into, there's always something new to discover on Spotify. With a mix of originals and many of the world's most popular shows, listening to podcasts on Spotify is easy. Just open the app, tap browse, and dive into their growing library. Subscribe to your favorites, including WTF, so you'll never miss a show. You can also download podcasts for those moments when you're up in the air or going underground. Into the bunker. Well, probably just a train. Podcasts on Spotify are streaming right now. Go check them out. All right? Wow. I'm winded. Let's do the show. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck buddies? What the fuck nicks? What the fucksters? Uh, what the fuck adelics? What's happening? How are you? So, all right, before I get ahead of myself and start talking about trying to deal with Thanksgiving today on the show, I've got, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big show. It's a big show. I've got Casper Collin and Benny Maupin. Uh, they were both, uh, Benny Maupin's a, uh, a, a jazz musician who was very tight with Lee Morgan, played with him, several different instruments, a little sax, a little, uh, a uh, little clarinet, big clarinet, uh, other st- we'll talk to him, but, uh, and also, uh, uh, Casper Collin, who, who directed the documentary, uh, I called him Morgan about Lee Morgan. And then after that, Jimmy Vaughn, Jimmy Vaughn, the blues guitar player, Jimmy Vaughn, Tex Mex Max. Yeah. Jimmy Vaughn, Stevie Ray's brother, also the, the guitar player, uh, and front man, half front man, used to be. Him and Kim Wilson for the fabulous Thunderbirds. He's going to be here. I'm very excited about that. He's a real, uh, he's a real musical hero to me. What's going on right now? Is it, it's Thanksgiving. I give the same advice every year. I'm not doing anything for Thanksgiving for the second year in a row. I'm not going down to my mommy's house to cook a big dinner this year because I don't have time. I'm in the middle of shooting glow and, uh, I'm in the middle of moving and we're going to go to, some, you know, Sarah the painter has some friends. We're going to go over there. And, uh, it seems like a, a hippie ordeal, a progressive vegan, uh, endeavor, but that's all right. That's all right. It's okay. I don't, I no longer have to make exceptions in terms of like, look, I haven't been eating much meat lately. Just keep the cholesterol down, keep things level, keep the, you know, the, the levels level in the blood, in the heart, in the fat, in the organs. So I know I could blow it out. Blow it out today. Somewhere I could. I could just go drop in some friend's house. I know you didn't invite me, but you got to have something to eat. But I'm not going to. Point is, this is the holidays. A lot of shit's going down. Shit is going down every fucking day. Some of it good. Some of it terrible. Some of it good. Some of it fucking just heinous. Heinous. Where do you fall? And I'm being vague on purpose. I'm being vague on purpose because one person's heinous is another person's awesome. That's what seems to be the big problem. Your heinous is my awesome. Sorry. Sorry. How do we figure out how to talk about that? Here's the deal. I know you're at, uh, I know you're at family's house or you got people over, some annoying guy, some annoying woman, some annoying kid, some annoying cousin, some annoying parent, mommy, daddy. The, the, the levels of intensity of annoying bordering on just, uh, you know, a, a crime against sanity is high. It's high today. I know, I know you're going through it. I know you're going, Hey, look, and you people that, 
have wonderful families and you're just having a nice time and everybody's sweet and everyone's smiling, maybe holding hands, praying a little bit in different languages, maybe, you know, grandma still got all her marbles, grandpa's, you know, passed away, but he was old and everyone's just thrilled. And maybe, maybe you're that and your kids are perfect and everything. Maybe you're that person or you, you get along with everybody in your family. Maybe you're that person. I don't know what to say to you. Have a nice day. Enjoy your food. And and congratulations on being mentally and spiritually healthy, you fuckers. That was rude. I apologize. No, I'm serious. I I don't envy you, but but, uh, I'm happy for you. So let me talk to the other people. All right, so what do I usually do? It's very hot here. I don't know what the temperature is like. Maybe I Hopefully, the best you can hope for, maybe you're already there, anywhere east of Los Angeles or California, you know, Midwest even. I just hope it's crisp and nice. Maybe even a light snow would be good. But just that crisp, nice fall, leaves changing, chill in the air that makes you reflect. Makes you reflect on who you are. That's what the Thanksgiving is for. Who are you? Who are you in there? Take that walk. Get out of that room. In between you uh, cleaning up and coffee. Get out. Don't help out. Especially if it was a rough dinner. If you had a fucking strap in for some political bullshit or some just emotional onslaught of triggering. You know, if you had a strap in for that, get, get out. You don't have to help clear the table. Fuck it. There's other people. Get out. Take a walk before you fucking hurt somebody with your mouth. By saying something horrible. Take that walk in that crisp air. Take it in. Think about it. Think about the crisis at hand. Think about the gratitude at hand. Balance them out. How's the macro? How's the micro? Macro, not great. Micro, could be good. Could be good. What do you got to do? What do you got to do? What's coming up? What are your challenges? Who are you? How can you be better? Do you have apologies to make? Do you have apologies to yourself to make? Do you have things that... You want to go back into that house and set and make some shit right? Might be a good time to do it. Or you know what? Fuck it. Don't worry about it. Just bathe in a certain... Breathe in that fall air. Breathe it out. Maybe cry a little bit. And just think about who we are. Who you are. Who we are. What we can do to be better people. Get a little Humility. Spread a little love, make an amends, you know, eat some fucking pie. Be nice to the kids. Rambling now, but Jesus, have a good Thanksgiving. Don't make it worse. Don't hurt yourself. Try not to emotionally hurt others. And uh, think about what you need to do next to further your growth as a person and help the bigger picture. How does your micro impact the macro? The big pick. All right, so that's all I got. But you know, but seriously, if the pie is good, enjoy it. And don't, don't, eat, with the berry pie, vanilla ice cream is the way to go. All right? Today's show is brought to you by Zelle. Zelle is a new way to send money to your friends and family from your banking app. Cash is easy to lose and checks take a while to clear. But with Zelle, once you're enrolled, the money moves right between bank accounts and typically arrives in minutes. And you know all the reasons why you need to move funds around quickly. Pay your share of the cost of dad's gift. Request half the cost of the Christmas tree you bought with your roommate. Or pay the personal trainer you hired after Thanksgiving with ease. All thanks to Zelle. It's so easy to use and works with almost everyone with a bank account in the U.S. And you don't have to worry about safety. Zelle is backed by major banks, which means you can send money confidently. Just go to ZellPay.com to learn more. That's Z-E-L-L-E-P-A-Y dot com. ZellPay dot com. Zell, this is how money moves. So, all right, so this is going to be interesting. Um, Casper Collin and Benny Maupin. Uh, Benny is a, is a jazz musician. The documentary 
that they they are both involved with. Uh, Casper directed it. I called him Morgan. Is streaming now on Netflix. If you're a voting member of the Academy, I urge you to check it out. It was just nominated for an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Documentary, and it blew my mind. And I was just getting into Lee Morgan. It all synced up, and now I get to talk to a guy who knew Lee Morgan, and I'm very excited about that. So. This is me talking to the director, Casper Collin, and to Lee's friend and musician, Benny Maupin. Now, I didn't know you did another documentary before uh, I called him Morgan about uh, Albert Eiler. It's true. Very much so. I do, I, but see, like, the, the fucked up thing about me and jazz is I, I, don't, I didn't know who Albert Eiler was. I'm sure you did, Benny, right? Oh, yeah. Of course. I knew him. Yeah. So there's this whole world of jazz that I, yeah, I'm just starting to get into in the last few years, and it seems and, and never ending. It is for me too. After like 25 years now, uh, yeah. And I mean, after making this first film about Albert Eiler, it took me seven years. Uh, was a fantastic, to make the film. To make the film, it was a fantastic journey. Uh, Why him? Why him? Because the music. Uh, yeah. I loved the music so much, uh, and at that time I was playing saxophone myself and. Albert was something else. But it was also because of Albert's connection to Sweden. And I was living in Stockholm at that time. And he kind of lived in... He was from Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. But then he moved to Sweden in 1962 and stayed there for almost a year. Yeah. And made his first album there. And, you know, but at the same time, he was touring with Swedish dance orchestras in the far north, up to Lapland. Yeah. And uh, looked at the midnight sun and everything. Got like a spiritual awakening. Uh Uh-huh. and then he moved to New York and became this kind of underground hero. And uh, John Coltrane was very inspired by him and uh, finally asked him to, to play at his funeral in 1967. So Albert was there with his group and Ornette was there with his group. So that's kind of who he was, very much an underground hero at this time. And because 60s. you're from Sweden, you, were, you felt connected to it. I think that was a, a very important part for me, yeah. yes. But I mean, I love music so much, so... Uh, and Albert was someone I heard for the first time I was maybe 18, 19 years old. I think I found the record either in my father's collection or at the, the library in Gothenburg. And it was music that, you know, if you ever heard Albert Heiler, it's kind of... Well, now i got to go. That's yeah, what I, but, but This you, morning I know i got to go listen to it. <laughs> That's, because when you hear it, it's like, oh, well, I did not know what to do with it. So yeah. It took a lot of years. Bef- then I was living in Gothenburg. When I moved to Stockholm, I realized this story with him there, and I connected to it. Yeah. And then that, that film come about. How far back do you go with it? Like where, where, like, where was jazz when you started? Well, you know, I'm from Detroit, so I got to grow up listening to gospel music, blues, of course, the beginning of Motown, yeah. uh, all of these things. And so many great musicians came to Detroit. During my early years, I got to be... Uh, very close to John Coltrane. I met Sonny Rollins uh, in Detroit. There was Yusef Latif, who was a big influence on me, as well as a lot of the other musicians. You were younger from, than them? From Detroit, yeah. yeah. Much younger. Yeah. You know, like uh, Sonny Rollins, he's like 10 years my senior. Right. He's 87 now. And, uh, you know, of course, Coltrane is gone, uh, and Yusef Latif is gone as well. But uh, I got to hear all of these different things. And little by little, that music that was coming from New York, basically, was sort of getting its way into radio yeah. in Detroit. But they would always apologize before they would play some of it. You know, at that time, I didn't have any of the records. And so the radio was like my saving grace. At you know, 12 noon, there was a guy who came on. And uh, he was the one who introduced the music. But he would always say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to present something to you now. It's a little bit different, so don't change the station. <laughs> but this is a young man who's creating quite a stir in the New York music scene. Wow. And he's he's doing something that's quite different. So yeah. uh, just, uh, just sit back and just listen to it. You yeah. know? And then I started to hear... Or Ness music, and it was like, wow. Because, you know, in my ears, I grew up uh, with the blues and the sure. gospel, and, and of course, the bebop. Detroit was very much a bebop city, heavily influenced by Charlie Parker and all the great musicians from that era. Were you playing at this point? I was beginning to play, yeah. I was beginning to play. I, th- I was like, uh, I was about 14 or 15. What, were you, what was your first instrument? My first instrument was actually the piano. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I went to the clarinet. 
but I really wanted to play the saxophone. So just before I got to go from middle school to like high school, I was able to get my first saxophone, and that's when I really I was able to dig in thanks to my band director at the high school. And that was a tenor. No, no, it was alto. Oh yeah, but Ornette, he's the one who captured me. Right. It was a, it was a completely different approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was no piano. First of all, there was the absence of the piano uh-huh. that opened up the aura of the music. I guess that's the only way I could describe it. Uh-huh. And since there was no chordal thing going on harmonically, it was just the rhythm with Billy Higgins or Eddie Blackwell or whoever was playing, then Don Cherry, yeah. and uh, you know. That was like, wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was like in the Charlie Hayden, and they were playing some things. But it was so unified. That is what really enabled me to understand. This is well thought out. Right. So you have something that sounds like, you know, from the future. Yes. But the context is solid. It's grounded. Yes. I had a conversation once when I was about 18 or 19 with John Coltrane. And he didn't talk about his music at all. But he was very excited about something. He said, there's a young man in New York right now who's creating quite an uproar. He said, <laughs> I went to hear him the week before I came here to Detroit, and uh, he was playing at a place called the Jazz Gallery, which uh-huh. was a place that was known for presenting things that were really cutting-edge yeah. things. And his name is Ornette Coleman. Oh, wow. And so I said, you know, I've been hearing him a little bit on the radio. He says, yeah. And it was Coltrane who planted the seed in my mind. He said, you need to come to New York because there's some young musicians in New York. They're a little bit older than you, some of them a little bit younger. He says, but the music is moving forward. And he said, and that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in in being able to capture some of that spirit in my music. Yeah. And so that's... That's what got you there? That's what got you to New York? He was the first one. He encouraged me. He said right away, straight out. He said, even if you don't stay in New York... Come and feel it, and just feel it, and listen to what's being done. Yeah, yeah. And and Coltrane himself was to be, you know, he was certainly pushing the envelope yes, he towards was. the end. So he he, he sort of was pushing out into what Ornette took up, right? That's right. Definitely. Yeah, he was very influenced by Ornette. Yeah, but that there was were a lot of musicians yeah. who influenced by Ornette, but I think they kept it. It's kind of on the down low. Mm-hmm. They didn't, because, because, I mean, if you were a bebopter, a bebopper, then if you were listening to Ornette, then you were like, you know, well, what's wrong with you? You know, why are you listening to that? Yeah. You know, what is that? There was, because it was the, it was the, the, the changing of the guard, so yeah. to speak. So some of the older guys who had worked so hard to develop that approach that was, popularized by Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and sure. all those musicians. They didn't that, want to go out there. They did not want to go out there. They had no intentions of going out yep. there. And so there was a lot of bad, bad, bad conversations mm-hmm. about Ornette destroying the music. And, Isn't that interesting? You know, he's, he's taking away from the art form that's been so sacred and so special. Conservative hipsters. Exactly. <laughs> Conser- beyond conservative. American music is the only music that continues to unfold. Yeah. And, and jazz around the world is warmly embraced, not only by musicians, but listeners and people who, who look to America for something different, something fresh, something adventurous. That takes a lot of courage. Well, right, and it's it's more appreciated, it seems, outside of America. You're absolutely right about that. I can't deny it. You know, like in Sweden, you know, this kid, he, he, <laughs> he, he gets hip to Albert when he's like 14 <laughs> and changes his life, and they make a movie about him, right? That, that's how it is. That's how it is. And but, I, but I think you really, I mean, that was the film about Albert was partly about that, that, that they... Could no, not get any gigs really in, in New York. I mean, Cecil had to play for the door, but then they went mm-hmm. to Sweden and they were booked for two weeks, you know, yeah. <laughs> prepaid. <laughs> so it was a big, big thing. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's part of this film, how the appreciation was bigger in Europe and in Scandinavia for this mm-hmm. music. Now, Lee Morgan, you got me at an interesting time with Lee Morgan because I had the experience with Lee Morgan that you had with, with Albert. My guy down at the record store, he gave me a, I think the first one he gave me, I think the first one I had was uh, Six Cents. Is that the Lee Morgan album? Yeah. I, I didn't register it. And then I got Gigolo, and mm-hmm. I put it on, and I'm just walking around the house, and I'm hearing this tone, and I'm like, what is that? Like, it just mm-hmm. went in. Like, I didn't register Six Cents. I didn't know really who Lee Morgan was. I was just buying records. But the tone on Gigolo just kind of blew my mind, and I felt something. Yeah. And then I locked into Lee Morgan stuff. 
and I was sort of like, does everybody know about this guy? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, like there was part of me that's sort of like, I think he's better than Miles. <laughs> like exactly, was, exactly. And then but, when your, your movie came out, I'm like, I had no idea about that story. <laughs> About and I'm sure everyone in the jazz world knows that his his wife or his common law wife shot him in the club. I guess the story was that he was in the middle of a set originally was the story, but then you somehow tracked down like the the coincidence of that guy, what's his name, Larry, Larry uh, Ridley, yeah, who you know, who, no, Larry Rennie Thomas with a cassette, yeah, yeah, Larry Rennie Thomas, mm -hmm. who ran into her, yeah. Helen, yeah. Morgan, yeah. who was just working at a church, correct? Or working for the school? What was it? She, she was actually taking an evening course. She had no education, you know. So she, she came to his evening course in history. He was a history teacher uh -huh. and just radio DJ. This was in the late 80s. <laughs> right. And, yeah, and then they he connected. Finds, and yeah. then he finds out, figures out who she is, yeah. and he's like, holy shit. And then he's got this weird cassette recording interview with her, mm. and you fill in all these gaps. And yeah. then you got all these guys who were able to fill in the gaps in the film, too. Now, you didn't hook up with Lee until, like, later in his career, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, it was 1968. But prior to that, yeah, during my teenage years, when Lee was actually playing with Art Blakey and the Jazz, Jazz Messengers, Messengers, yeah, that's good I stuff. got to hear him, I think, the first time I heard him was maybe 19, 1958, 1959, uh -huh. because they came to Detroit. Yeah. And they would come usually maybe twice a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it just happened that even though I was under 21, yeah. it was a law. If you weren't 21, you couldn't come in. Yeah. The guys would even just let me in. They said, you have to sit somewhere special. Because they knew you were a player. Well, they knew that I wanted the music, and I didn't come in there to drink any alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want a beer or anything. Yeah. Like that. I mean, you know, so but Morgan was always a part of my, my, my musical infancy, I say. Yeah, yeah. You know, he came with Art Blakey, and that music just captured me with Benny Colson and all those guys. Well, that hard bop stuff was, was accessible. You know, that, it that's was, true. It wasn't like, you know, straight up bebop and it had a pretty strict blues groove. Yeah. You could yeah. lock right into it yeah. and swing a little mm -hmm. and maybe even snap. You know, you're not, you're not going to get confused. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it was the beginning of a, of a shift. Yeah. From the, from the, from the bebop. Right. It, itself as a, as a pure form. Right. Of the music. Yeah. You know, and uh, with composers like Benny Golson and Bobby Timmons, I mean, they created these things that were related, basically, to the to the black church again. Yeah, you know, this here and that there. Yeah, yeah. and uh, <laughs> yeah. those tunes. Right. I mean, you know, and uh, it just kind of went on from there. You know, yeah. but I mean, those were things that the general public could have access to. Right. Exactly. There, yeah. there was a. There, it seemed like there was an innate. Marketing strategy. Well, there was an innate marketing strategy, and there was also some tremendous foundational stuff going on with Art Blakey as the drummer. Mm. Right. Oh, yeah. He yeah. knew how to form it. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And he had the guys who could carry it over. Yeah. So Morgan was there. He was in my head. But then, you know, fast forward. Uh, when I moved to New York, which was 1962. Yeah. Uh, I never saw Lee Morgan. Who were you seeing? I saw Freddie Hubbard. I heard, uh, of course, I heard Dizzy. Yeah. Uh, Kenny Dorham. Who what got, year is this that you go? 66? No, this 66. is like shortly after I got there. These guys were active. Like what year were you there? So I came and I moved there mm -hmm. when I was 21 in yeah. 1962. Okay, so right. So I yeah. celebrated right. my 22nd birthday right. in New York, you know? So the scene was, everyone was on the scene. Everybody was happening. I never saw Miles because that was another realm. But, uh. It was? What realm? Well, was I mean, you know, he wasn't like. Uh, he wasn't accessible. Yeah, you right. Know, right. He these, wasn't out in the cats, clubs. No, these <laughs> these guys that I mean, he might later I discovered he would go to the club to hear what they were doing. I sneak in. But his yeah. thing was on a completely different level. Sure, just artistically. Yeah, and where he was, you know, as a band leader. Yeah, the, the whole strata of the uh -huh. thing. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. the mystique. Yeah, the of mystique. Miles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Prince of Darkness. <laughs> That's what they used to call him in New York. <laughs> but uh, you know, I got to hear these guys, but I never saw Lee. Because that was when he was down for the count. That's when he was busy. Strung out? Yeah, he was very much addicted. I discovered, you know, actually I knew he was, I knew he was, uh, addicted mm. the last couple of times I saw him in Detroit because I could just tell. I mean, Detroit musicians were heavily influenced by Charlie Parker, so many of them were addicted. So, yeah. you know, if when you're around people who are addicted, 
and you and you look yeah. at them enough, you can tell physically. Oh yeah, they're what droopy. They're, what they're, oh, they're droopy, <laughs> they're scratching, and their you know, their whole uh, being is uh, droopy. That, and yeah, yeah, that whole yeah. thing that goes with that yeah. na- nasty yeah. habit. And so, uh, fast forward. You know, I'm in New York working, doing my private lessons, playing yeah. with the Puerto Rican cats, just getting all of the exposure that I could possibly get, hanging out with Marion Brown and Wayne Shorter's brother, Alan Shorter, who was a great composer and mm-hmm. trumpet now, player. Now, when do you start playing all the instruments? Like you play the, your flute, piccolo, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Bass, clarinet? Well, uh, I basically, when I got to New York, I was playing the tenor. Yeah. And uh, I had the flute. Yeah. And then uh, a little bit later on, uh, a musician who was known as an avant-garde musician. His name was Marzette Watts. Yeah, he was one of the one of the. ES- He's going deep now. Yes, you know, really deep <laughs> the now. The ESP yeah. guys. <laughs> yes. But Marzette was like, a, he was a painter. Yeah, in, w- heavily influenced by Jackson Pollock. Right. So you know, people in New York say, "Oh God, he's out of his mind," but he was also working to to play the the saxophone and and the bass clarinet. Yeah. And one day he called me up. He says, "Man, I know you play different instruments." He says, "But uh, I was just in Paris doing a show because he was showing." Yeah. He, this cat was actually going. He was making more money doing his paintings than he was as a musician because yeah, yeah. as a musician, <laughs> he is too lame. I can't hire him for anything. Oh yeah. <laughs> he doesn't read music he doesn't know any standards i mean you know he's better off just you know let freedom ring that kind right of thing. yeah yeah so he called me he says i got this bass clarinet i just purchased a new one and i want to sell my old one he says why don't you come over and take a look at it and uh if you if you like it then you know you will just strike a deal yeah so i said okay so i went over to his house and uh he showed me the bass clarinet yeah and i looked at it I picked it up and I kind of felt it. I'd never held one in my hands. He says, yeah, it's a, it's a decent instrument, you know. I said, well, how much do you want for it? And he said, give me $50 for it. <laughs> yeah. So I said, okay, can I give you 20 now and I'll come back, you uh-huh. know, when I get some uh-huh. more bread? He said, yeah. yeah, just take it, just pay me when you, when you get straight, you know. So now you got a whole new thing. I got a whole new voice <laughs> all together, man. And I kept it in my apartment. I did Don't not stuff, yeah. bring it out in public at all. No, why? No, well, I was, first was of all. Wasn't hip? It was it was humbling, yeah, you know, and I couldn't really get the sound. Oh I mean, yeah, and I, mm. you know, it was it was just the the nature of it. First of all, it's made out of wood, yeah, and uh, you know, I had to get uh, had to develop my my armature and my ear for listening to it. Of course, I had already heard Eric, yeah, which Dolphy, was a yeah. motivating factor. Eric Dolphy, that you know, I said, wow, if I could play even one iota as well, that as was he his did. instrument. Well, that was one of them. <laughs> But he played the flute, the alto, <laughs> yeah. and he played regular clarinet, yeah. and he played the bass clarinet. I mean, in my mind, he's the one right. who set the tone for me. Right. But later, like I say, you know, I just kind of developed myself. I got yeah. To, I got I to be, it out. be around New York with the guys. Yeah. They were hiring me and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of take me through some of the gigs and everything. And then I got a, I got a good gig, which is the first real important international gig. Yeah. And that was with the great composer and pianist Horace Silva. Horace Silver. Horace Yeah, Hardy. yeah. I auditioned yeah. for his band one time, and uh, he turned me down. He says, no, I don't think, uh, you know, I got somebody else in mind. And then uh, I'm in a rehearsal. Finally, he did hire yeah. me after a second audition. Yeah, yeah. And by then, I had played <laughs> with McCoy. I had played with a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. And I didn't give a damn if he had me or not. But I wanted the gig because I knew that I was going to work because Horace worked. He had bands that actually made trips and went to Europe. And It's exciting. I was in rehearsal with him for our first tour. It's 1968. Yeah. And the door opens, and it's Lee Morgan. Okay. And he looked great. He got all cleaned up. He was sharp oh, as could be. I mean, he was yeah. dressed well, and the skin looked good. I mean, you know, yeah. he, he was definitely not high. And, uh, you know, he came right over to me. He says, Horace, I'm sorry to interrupt your, your rehearsal, man, but I got to see for a second if I can talk to your saxophone player. And he came over to me and he said, hey, man, I'm getting ready to do another recording with Blue Note. Will you do it with me? I said, yeah. He said, okay, I have somebody from Blue Note call you. He said, that's it. And he was gone. Yeah. That took every bit of about three or four minutes. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we, the first recording I did with him was called Caramba. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was my first one. And what was he like? He was really during the time that we came together. Yeah. Because he was clean. Yeah. There was no, there was no private side. You know what I mean? Right. He wasn't always. No secrets? No, he wasn't trying to go off somewhere so he could come back all lit up. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. And so 
we focused on the music. That was right. that was our thing. And as a result of other recordings we did, we did uh, Tender Moments with McCoy Tyner, and we did one with uh, Lonnie uh, Smith. Who's you and Lee? Uh, well, it wasn't just us. It was right. Julian Priester yeah. and a bunch of other musicians. And we did these things. You know, we just we just got tight. We loved the way we played together. The sound was great. Yeah, Caramba was the, was the turning point. And then uh, finally, after my stay with Horace Silver, which was about two years, yeah, uh, I came back to New York and I called Lee. I said, "Hey, Lee, uh, I'm home, man, and I'm, I'm done. Horace just fired everybody." Yeah, because that's what he would do. He'd keep you a couple of years. Yeah, and then he'd say, "Okay, now you go out and do do your thing." Yeah, you know. And so he said, "Well, that's that's really cool." He says, "Uh." Uh, George Coleman, a great saxophonist. Uh-huh. He says, George has been playing with me, but George is starting to get more of his own work, and he wants to have his own band, and I need a tenor player. He said, will you come and work with me? I said, hell yeah. You're back? I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> so I just went like from being unemployed for maybe two weeks. Well, how'd you meet Herbie Hancock? I met Herbie Hancock before all of this happened. Yeah, because you did and, a lot of records with him. Well, yes, I did. Yeah. And uh, I met Herbie Hancock through my through my chief mentor is Sonny Rollins. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, once I got to New York, I called Sonny because I met Sonny in Detroit when I was like 17. And, yeah, yeah. And to this day, he's my man. Yeah. I call him at least once a week. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Sonny. How's he doing? He's doing good. Good. Yeah, he's in great shape. Man. Good, good. And just, you know, tremendous spirit. You know, I went to see him at the beginning of September and spent three days at his house and we just oh, hung sweet. out and talked. Yeah. And, Gave him a full report on what I'm doing, you know, where I'm going, and uh-huh. you know what's happening. And yeah, he encouraged me. Yeah, he always has. You know, that's so sweet. That was the beginning of a, a completely different cycle, you know. But the 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 beauty of it was that during that period where I was like working during the day and everything, I called Sonny. And Sonny's going to play at a place called a Half Note. Yeah, a really famous place where Coltrane plays all those incredible solos, and everybody played the half note. Mm-hmm. It was like when Train wanted to play somewhere for four or five weeks, yeah. he could play in the half note, yeah. and nobody else could get a gig. They could yeah. just forget about it. <laughs> yeah. He said, no, I'm sorry, Train is here for the next month. You just have to come back later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was the same with Sonny. Yeah. Yeah. And so one night, Sonny says, well, meet me when you come, and uh, you can go in the club with me. And so I said, okay. So I'm standing outside. It's wintertime. I'm all bundled up and everything. And uh, I look one way, and I see Sonny walking towards me, and I look down the street, and here's Herbie walking towards me, because I had seen him with Miles, but yeah. I didn't know him. Yeah, yeah. But we all kind of met like that. Right. And Sonny looked at Herbie, and he says, Herbie, do you know Benny? <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was it. That was it. From? So what made you make this Lee Morgan movie, and how did you reach out to all these guys? That's a very good question. Because when you said before how you found Lee, yeah, I found... It's a little bit similar to me, I think. Even yeah. if I've been around listening to Yes for a long time, yeah. I made this film about Arbe. It took me seven years. After that, being a filmmaker, I said to myself, I will not spend another f- seven years making a documentary about a, a dead jazz musician. Because <laughs> Albert d- died <laughs> in 1970. <Yeah. laughs> it's, it's quite a challenge to do yeah. those films. Find, right. find the people, find the material, find the money. And you try to create the film because there's not too much material left, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, but then... Being very music interested, it was, I think, eight years ago now. I was just watching YouTube. I like to do it sometimes, see if there's something I haven't seen or heard. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was Lee Morgan playing with Art Blake and the Jazz Messengers. Uh, it was from 1961 in Tokyo. It was Lee's solo. Uh, Lee's solo there in that live recording. Yeah. I never heard anyone play trumpet like that before. So it is like that when I find something, I, I kind of listen to it on repeat for a week. So it just sure. goes on and on. So I, and I was still reluctant to do another jazz film, but it grew on me. And uh, this Lee Morgan is kind of a special guy, I realized. And uh, I found another great music, like Search for the New Land, and uh, the music that you did together, Live at the Lighthouse. It was, it was new to me. I, I, I'd listened a lot to jazz, but I missed Lee somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, but then I said to myself, maybe there's a film there. We're going to see you do this initial research. How many people is still around? Right. Is there an archival footage? Uh, can we do something? And then I realized quite a few people were still around, like Benny, like some yeah. other people. And I remember in the beginning, I I just called around and I had a few meetings with them, started to, to, to listen to them. Because at this time, I only know about the very basics about Lee, like the Wikipedia no- knowledge, yeah, which sure. was like he was this, <laughs> you know, uh, young guy uh, that, that was 
recorded with everyone at 18 years old, you know, and he was a teenager. Yeah. And, and he was with Art, Art Blakey, he was with Dizzy, he was record. I mean, he was signed with Blue Note when he was 18. What did you do when you were 18? I mean, <laughs> not much. <laughs> not much. I mean, <laughs> that's quite remarkable. And, you know, he did all those records for, for Blue Note. I know that. And then I know that he was shot by a woman at the club uh, in the early 70s when he was in the young 30s. I didn't know anything about this woman. Uh, and I, it didn't seem many people know anything about her either. I realized when I read that, and also when I saw those YouTube clips, because you can see the comments under. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and a lot of the diehard Lee Morgan fans say, hey, he's so great. Why is he gone? Oh, that, that, that bitch that, that shot him, she's yeah. burning in hell forever. It was a lot of those right. very... Mm -hmm. You know, a angry anger, a lot of anger. Of course, I mean, anger on the internet comments. It's yeah, very common. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But <laughs> I mean, I, I can see those guys. I yeah. mean, she, this woman, took their right. idol, idol away. Right. Uh, but I mean, talking with those guys that I found that were still alive, quite a few of them started to talk about the last four years in Lee's life. Mm. Right. Uh, <laughs> that he has spent with a woman named Helen, uh, and they talked about her. Like you did in a very lovely and passionate way. So you knew her, Benny? Oh, yeah, most definitely. We spent a lot of time together. It seemed like everybody sort of knew her in the scene. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I, I spent hours at their home up in the Bronx. Yeah. Uh, she was always at the gigs. She was always handling the receipts and making sure that the money was right at the yeah. end of the night. So he didn't have to be preoccupied with any of that. He was just playing his music and, yeah. you know, coming back yeah. from being, you know, addicted. She yeah. helped him, you know, of course, you know, fight through the... <laughs> yeah, the, <clears throat> the sweating the and painful, the horrible. And, yeah. yeah, you know, got him on a methadone and everything. So I got to, I got to see him... At that time, yeah, you know, when he was really fighting to 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 reemerge, yeah, to reinvent himself, and 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 you recorded with him like on the live at the lighthouse. That's like that's right. We I came mean, here at Homosa Beach. That's a big album, man. Yeah, well, we came Great. and you know, uh, when I started playing with him, he wasn't writing a lot, so I came to a rehearsal one day and he. Uh, he said, hey, man, you got any tunes? So I said, yeah, I got yeah. one. I, I got one. I brought it with me, you know? Yeah. And we played it, and he he messed around with it. He says, ooh, I like this. <laughs> Have you got any more? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> so pretty soon, yeah. there was five tunes, and they all on Live at the Lighthouse. Yeah, nice. He gave me all of it. He said, hey, man, these are your tunes. Publish them. Do whatever the hell you want to do with them. You know, he says, I love playing them. And he, and he used those tunes. My tunes and Harold Mayburn's tunes yeah. and Jamie Merritt's tunes. Yeah. Everybody wrote tunes. The only one who didn't write a tune was Mickey Roca, uh -huh. the drummer. But Mickey added a flavor to the tunes with his with his drumming and his special touch that the tunes never would have had had it not been for Mickey Roca. Right. The drummer. He was fantastic. Yeah. So in a sense, you know, his his work was a part of those compositions sure. that made them come to life right. when he played there. The backbone. Yeah, it was really a tremendous. So, thing. so you, so he's like, you know, he's he, he's coming back. He's doing good. Yeah. Lee Morgan's kicking ass. He's, man, he's kicking some serious ass. He was. And Helen seemed okay. Everything seemed okay to you. Hey, man, look, we had a lovely time. We spent two weeks in San Francisco, playing at a place called the Both End, mm -hmm. and during that time, we recorded for the radio, which ended up being a bootleg. Oh yeah, that's out there somewhere. I never made a dime from that because uh -huh. somebody took the masters. And nobody know where the masters. You've seen went. the record though. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we finally saw it. Yeah. You know, they put somebody else's name on it. It wasn't my name. It was Billy Harper's name. Uh -huh. But, you know, I said, hey, look, so be it. I mean, you know, right. that's just the way stuff goes, you know. But we had a fantastic time here in California because San Francisco was so great. And we're playing like six nights a week and, you know, having great times to just travel around the city. Is Helen here. traveling with you guys? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. everybody was one happy family. Yeah, man. We came here. We went out to the lighthouse, out of the ocean. Beautiful. But that was really really the feeling I had when looking into this, talking yeah. to those guys. It was like one big family and yeah. Helen was a part of it. And then I realized, okay, this is the same woman that actually shot Lee Morgan. Uh, and it was like I was in the middle of a Greek tragedy or something, or a Shakespearean drama. Mm, yeah. That was the feeling I had uh, mm. in the early. And then I found this cassette we were talking about. How the fuck Thomas. did you find that? <laughs> you know, this was in, in the internet era, era you know. <laughs> Still. Oh, so, so you knew it was out there? <laughs> no, but, but I mean, 
I did this initial research and I found on the internet because I didn't know much about Helen. I, yeah. I saw this guy. He had a blog, Lorena Thomas, and you could read parts of that interview he made with her. Yeah. So I realized, okay, she lived until 1996. Okay, and he made an interview. Interesting. I want to hear it. So I got in contact with him and he sent me not a cassette, but a CD of it. And I remember listening to it the first time was that, wow, it wasn't just the story she, she's telling because she's telling about her life, you know, getting her first son when she's 13, yeah. the other when she's 14, yeah. leaving them behind because she was looking for another life. This was outside the Wilmington in North Carolina and then yeah. went on and, and in, into New York. Yeah. Uh, and and created a new life, met Lee. Became his manager, wife, everything. But also took care of a lot of the guys. Yeah. It seems. Everyone was hanging out. She's making food. You know, it was <laughs> she, like the den mother. She, yeah. She was. She was, yeah. in a way. Uh, but that, that was the feeling I, I had, really, that this camaraderie that she was part of. And uh, this tragic night when she shot him, because everyone was hating Helen, of course, and has been, that wasn't part of this family that you were. Uh, they didn't know. They didn't know what she had done to him, that she actually helped him through those hard years, and they didn't know that story. So I thought that that was she should be remembered also for that part. I mean, it's sympathetic of course, character. Yeah, but it's wrong to kill someone. Of course, right. we all think so. But she, people should know her not only as the murderer, also as part and, of this and, family, and also know you know what went down. Yeah. yeah. See, there were a lot of things that happened yeah. that Lee shared with me personally because he and I were very, very close. Uh -huh. And he told me one time, he said, you know, Helen comes from a background where she's been severely abused by a man that she was close to. And Lee sort of described it as he was the kind of guy coming from work and, you know, she was there, everything would be beautiful because yeah. she was a very great cook and a yeah. great homemaker, and the guy would just start beating her. Right. So, you know, the that kind of suffering and that kind of struggle, that is not something that's easily forgotten. I mean, you can you can go on from away from that, and a lot of women don't. They stay for whatever reason, and uh, she did. Yeah. That's why when she moved away from where she had been living. She left all of that behind. Ran away. But you can't you can't run from the pain yeah. and the scars that an abusive relationship leaves. Right. And the film helped me to 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 sort of deal with my own closure about everything. Oh yeah, because, how so? Well, you know, because we were so close. Yeah. You know, I just felt like wow you know, something went terribly wrong there. You know, because when I left, everything was kind of shifting a little bit. And and Lee was going through some real transformative Where stuff. Where were you going? Where'd you go? Well, I, I left him after a couple of years, and we had done all this stuff because I got a call from Herbie. Okay, right. And so I said, Lee, I want to take this gate with Herbie. And he kind of paused. We were talking on the phone. And he said, man, do it. Yeah. It's going to be good for you. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's how much he loved me, you know. And whenever I would go back to New York, I mean, he was the first person I called. Yeah. So, you know, this last conversation we had, it was about what he was going through. And he, and he told me uh, how he was withdrawing from the methadone. Yeah. And he told me how he felt. He says, I feel bad. I feel really bad. He says, I ache all over my body. Yeah. He said, because... Anything that's strong enough to counteract the withdrawal symptoms of heroin yeah. has got to be stronger than the heroin. Right. He says, I've given up one habit for another. Sure. He said, but I'm backing off from it. I'm backing off from it, man. He says, and uh, I'm not feeling good. I'm not feeling good. You know, he's telling me how I was feeling. You know, we never yeah. talked about feelings. Right. That was never it. Mm -hmm. You know, but he was, he had to, he had to unload because emotionally he was going through these changes and then he told me about this woman that he had met and he had spent the night at her house which was kind of like that was never an issue after our gigs he went home with Helen mm. that was always it Yeah, that was it that was the end of the night receipts bap the gig right. was over right. everybody got paid sure and everybody went their own separate ways yeah okay so he said uh, I spent the night out and Helen's calling around. She didn't know what to think. You know, where is he? Is he hurt? Have, is she called the hospitals, calling the police and everything. And then so finally, uh, when he did get back home, uh, she realized that there was, the, there was a vibe. 
you know. But by then, I, I wasn't there physically anymore. Yeah. Fortunately for me. You weren't there. No, I wasn't there. But when I saw Casper's film, yeah. and I heard the comments from the other guys, yeah. I started thinking about the conversations that, that we had had. Right. And how he he pushed her very aggressively to the point that she ended up being out on the street with no coat and none snow. of that. Yeah. And I and I, then I started thinking, you know, I said, that kind of violence triggered something that was deeply buried in her life. Oh, yeah. She had no, she was temporarily insane as far as I'm concerned. Sure, and he he was her whole life. He was, he was, and, and, and the way she responded, it was just like, for whatever reason, she bought the gun. I mean, that was a comic thing, you know. He bought the gun for her. Yeah. I saw the gun. Yeah. I held the gun in my hand. Yeah. One time I went to dinner and Lisa said, hey, man, come here. I want to show you something. Takes me in their bedroom, which is lovely. I mean, the whole apartment was fantastic. And then he opens up a drawer and he pulls out this pearl handle revolver. It's beautiful. He yeah. says, yeah. He says, I, I got this. I said, man, what are you going to do with this? Right. And he says, well, you know, somebody might try to stiff me for my bread, man. I might have to run up on somebody. Uh -huh. I said, oh, man, you're not going to use that. Man. And he said, you want to get one? I said, no, I don't want anything to do with that. I handed it back to him. He folded it up in the cloth and he put it back in the drawer. Uh -huh. But that weapon had been in my hand. Oh, yeah. You know, and I said, it's a, it's a great weapon. My father used to have weapons, so yeah. I knew about weapons already. Sure. But, uh, you know, that, that whole exchange. So when I saw the film, I, I started thinking and I started thinking. And I said, you know, from her abusive past, something snapped. Yeah, well, she thought that, you know, he was with another woman. But not only that. It was the aggressiveness of him pushing her out into the street. That, from the club. From the club. That That's that it. violent act. Yeah. And with his, snow. There was his, a snowstorm going yeah, on. Yeah. And they, oh, that was just With crazy. his hands. Yeah. I said, okay, that was the trigger. Right. But she had the gun. She, she had went the gun. down there with the gun. She went down there with the gun. To make a statement of some kind. I don't know if that was what her intentions right. were. And we'll never know. That's right. But she did have the weapon. And uh, I think she I th wanted to confront him. Well, of course she wanted to confront him, you know, right. because he wasn't coming forth and telling her very much. Yeah. And everything was all kind of up in the air and everything, you know. But I felt that at the moment she killed him, she killed herself. Yeah. She killed herself. That's what happened there. You know, and I said, you know, this is really clear to me from seeing the film. I was, I've seen the film now three times. Yeah. And I said, ah, oh, I got it now. I see yeah. what happened. Temporarily, she was insane. Yeah. She never would have done that. Yeah. But, you know, when you carry something and someone's violent towards you. I, and he, and she was hurt. And she, she felt deeply hurt. Betrayed. You know, like you all knew, of that. Because, you know, all the guys knew. Right. You well, know, I mean, you know, they were in the band. So yeah, I don't right. know how public it was right. with them. But he shared with me right. that he met somebody and he said, you know, Helen is older than I am. Sure. And there, I've got a vibe with this woman. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I I didn't mean to hurt her. He says, but, you know, at the end of the night, the vibe was such. I just wanted to go and be with her. Yeah. He couldn't get out though. She wasn't going to let him go. Well, you know, he didn't. He didn't come home. And then when he did, I don't know what their exchange sure. was, but I'm quite sure it wasn't lovely. You know, because it was it was painful. So you did know. you see Helen after all this went down? You know, after I left, I never saw her again until I saw the film. No kidding. And that wasn't her. That was just her voice. What happened there? What kind of time did she do? How did she end up out? Yeah, this is like a film. In itself, almost, we could make another film. <laughs> it could continue and continue. We had to make a lot of decisions when we made it. I mean, because, yeah, it looks like pretty short time. She was in there five years. Uh -huh. uh, and then it was, uh, did you say parole? What do you say yeah. in English? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, she was out in New York for a while. And then she moved back with the help of her son down to North Carolina and started on again. And again built another life for her but from a filmmaking perspective i mean the big challenge in this film was you know with lee we had the fantastic music all the blue note photographs almost two thousand black and white fantastic photographs to mm. choose from he is one of the most well-documented musicians ever from this era 
playing uh-huh. jazz from Blue Note there. Uh, he liked to dress up that guy. He did like to dress up, and then we had all the footage the, um, when he was playing. Yeah. But, but with Helen, she did not like to be photographed. We had maybe nine or ten still photographs of her, right. but then we had her voice. So how, how are we going to solve this? I mean, balance those two lives up in yeah. the film. That was the biggest challenge. So I think that was what I was trying to say before. When I first heard her voice, it wasn't just only the story she was telling that is magnificent. It's the sound of her voice, too. So I think when we were making this film and editing it, we were feeling kind of almost like a musicality in her voice. I really loved listening to that voice yeah. and working with that cassette recording like like a like a music piece in a yeah. way. So I think the nicest comment I ever had on this film was when it was shown, it was premiere in Venice and then I went to Telluride Film Festival and there the opera director Peter Sellers were, he was there. And the, he opera, really loved, the guy from the opera? Yeah, yeah, and he really loved the film and he hugged me and said, hey man, <laughs> what have you done? This <laughs> is fantastic. And, and and I will never forget it because I said, you, you, you don't do it, the do it between Hill, Helen and Lee, you know, <laughs> between his trumpet and her voice and I said, oh wow, that, that that was deep to me because that was really what we felt when we edited this film. And yeah. we was trying to treat her. I mean, that's her story with, with what she's saying, but yeah. it's also like music. Oh, yeah. So, so you made a little jazz yourself. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hey, good job. With very few elements. Yeah. <laughs> I thank Casper for making the film because, you know, I was with Herbie. All this stuff happened. I was stunned. Yeah. And I couldn't come back to New York. Yeah. I didn't go to the funeral because I couldn't. Yeah. Herbie had booked all these gigs. And, uh, you know, I was just, I was just fucked up behind it. Yeah. I stayed high a lot, that's for sure. Because all my friends had some good weed and the great cocaine and shit. Yeah. And I, I got, I was getting higher than a motherfucker, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but then it, it got to a point where it started to be abusive, and I've always been able to say, okay, that's yeah. the end of that. Yeah. You know, but it, it just hurt me, man. And when I came back to New York, there was an emptiness that I felt, you know. Yeah. I said, wow, I can't call him. Ugh. Yeah. I can't call him. Or and, her. Or her. I was never angry with her. Yeah. I wasn't. I was hurt, but I wasn't angry because I loved her too. Yeah, yeah. It's like losing two good friends. Yeah, yeah. You know, I never saw her again. Yeah. Until I saw her in the film. Yeah. You know, and then it just brought back all these moments that we shared. You know, the you dinners. still got those. Yeah, the dinners that we had, and and uh, she's the, you know because I would go up there, and and Lee would say, "Oh man, let's have dinner and let's." Let's go get some blow and just go out and hear everybody. <laughs> and that's what we would do. We might go to three or four clubs in one night. I, I'll tell you, the it was a, a tragic movie, but the feeling at the end was not sad. Right. right. That's right. That's not easy. That's to right. Do. That's I mean, not easy to do. Yeah, you have to. You have to get your head really straight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you thought about this for seven years. <laughs> you know, I, I would, gotta live with this. Yeah, you know, I would say that the the editing we. We edited this film over a three-year period, and uh, so that was very important to really have that time. And I worked with excellent editors when when making this film. So, but it was very important, really, to coming in from the music side with Lee, and also ending with the music in this film, uh, and to have that music feeling all through the film. So, uh, yeah, it was a lot of struggle to get it together because, I mean, basically, it's it's a fantastic story, but you also w- will have that music as part of it all the way, and. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the idea was really to make this film to be experienced in a cinema with the right sound, quite loud, to so really hear the the beauty and the power in this music. I mean, yeah. Well, great. well, thanks for doing it, man. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> and thanks for talking, guys. Hey, thank you. Okay, as I mentioned, I called him Morgan is in contention for a Best Documentary Feature nomination. So if you're a member of the Academy and you haven't seen it, please check it out. Speaking about documentaries, I'd also like you to check out another doc that's in contention. It's called Side Men, Long Road to Glory, about the lives of some legendary bluesmen. I did the narration for it, and I hope you're considering voting for it as well. Okay? Dig it. We're sponsored today by Sonos, which I love because it means my whole house is wired for sound. And now it's even better because of Sonos One, the speaker that understands what you tell it to do. Yeah, that's right. I'm talking to my speakers now. I mean, I probably always talk to them, but now they actually listen and do what I ask them to do. 
Wow, the future, right? Sonos One works with all my existing Sonos speakers, but it's also combined with Amazon Alexa, the easy-to-use voice service, so I can have hands-free control of my music. I can just use my voice to play songs or turn up the volume whenever I want. While I cook, when I'm in the shower, when I'm out here in the garage, I just say it and it happens. But it's not just for songs. Turn on lights, adjust the temperature, check news and traffic, manage your smart devices, and more, all using a single Sonos speaker. And since since Sonos is continually updating with new features, services, and skills, your music and voice options will both keep getting better over time. Right now, Sonos is offering WTF listeners 10% off one order of $2,500 or less for any product on Sonos.com. This offer is available for a limited time only and cannot be combined with other discounts or promotions. Use the promo code WTF10, that's WTF10, at Sonos.com to receive this offer. Yes. Yes. So, Jimmy Vaughn. Z- Jimmy Vaughn. What can I say about Jimmy Vaughn? I was thrilled to meet the guy. When I was in high school, later in high school, I don't know where I got him, uh, the first two Fabulous Thunderbirds records. The uh, Girls Go Wild and What's the Word? Those two records. I didn't know who they were. I'm not sure where I got the records. I tend to think that I got them from a box of records from the record store next door, the R&B record store next door to where I worked in uh, high school, and they didn't want them anymore. But it was just like the greatest, most fun, you know, just kind of swing groove Texas blues music that I'd ever reckoned with. And I just I just loved it. And I loved the cover. It was just this goofy-ass cover. Keith Ferguson, Jimmy Vaughn, Kim Wilson, Mike Buck. And then I saw a sign somewhere in Albuquerque that the Fabulous Thunderbirds are going to be playing the Golden Inn out on Highway 14 in Albuquerque. I'll tell Jimmy about this. So, like, at that time, I was very into buying uh, vintage uh, clothing. I had a couple of... Uh, I had a sharkskin jacket that I was sort of obsessed with, and then there was a couple of shiny suits. I had a gold suit and a silver suit that were shiny. It wasn't quite sharkskin, but it was shiny. I don't know what the material was, but shiny. And I got my skinny ties. And, you know, I combed my hair up. I did a little of that, you know. I've been, I've been, I've been out there in the desert fashion wise for 40 years. 40 years lost in the desert. I finally figured it out about five years ago. But I can't remember who I went up there with to see the fabulous Thunderbirds at this old biker bar, the Golden Inn, which later burned down. But I had a great time, man. Got drunk in the car. Maybe smoked a little weed, went in there with my shiny suit and just danced until I swept my ass off for like an hour and a half, man. And they just rocked the place. And it was just life changing or at least month changing, maybe half a year changing. But uh, since then, I've always I've always loved Jimmy Vaughn. I love the way he plays guitar. He had a big influence on how I handle a guitar. And I imagine most of you never heard of him, but Jimmy, will, he'll be playing in New York next week, December 1st and 2nd at Jazz at Lincoln Center. The most recent album of the Jimmy Vaughn Trio with Mike Flanagan is called Live at Sea Boys. I saw that band with Jimmy Vivino in Austin the last time I was there, and that's when I first met Jimmy, and I was uh, a little fucking starstruck. Jimmy Vaughn's the guy that makes me starstruck. So this is me and Jimmy Vaughn talking. <laughs> I live the dream in the garage, Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like many people. But uh, but when I play blues, when I want to play with records, I play to your first two records. I play to those Fabulous Thunderbirds records. Oh, cool. Those Thank are the you. ones I play to because that your guitar sound and your guitar playing, was to me, was the best to, to learn from and to play to. Well, that, thank you. That's just the truth of it. That's where I come from. <laughs> And I saw you in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the Golden Inn. There's an old biker's bar up behind the Sandia Mountains. Yeah. I, I was in high school. I put on my shark skin suit and I went and saw you. That must have been like, what, 78? Well, you know, the, the whole thing is a dream. Right now? No, it, it, it was from the beginning. So, you know, like, like you're a kid and uh, you don't like what things, the way things are going necessarily or yeah. something ain't right and you get this idea gee, I wonder if I could be a guitar player. Because you heard a B.B. King record or something. Yeah. Or you heard uh, yeah. whatever it is, you know, that, yeah. that flipped your switch. Right. And and you, you you just do it because 
first of all, you can, you find out you can do it. Right. A little bit. And then, you know, then your, your dreams take over and you just go for it. And then you just sort of end up playing with Clapton in Madison Square Garden. Well, yeah, but I think, I mean, everybody with a guitar, that's the American dream, isn't it? It's one of them. One of them for sure. <laughs> yeah. But I remember when I first started playing guitar, I, I had a, the guy at school in junior high, he told me, he said, look, he said, if you want a girlfriend, if you want the girls, you're going to have to play football. There's no other way. And I was like, really? And he said, well, you have to come down there on Thursday and, and you have to go out for football. And I'm thinking, I didn't say anything. I was thinking, man, I'm, I'm the worst football player in the whole school, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that didn't make any difference. So I went down there and I said, I don't even know what to do. He said, well, you look like, you look like you're a left halfback. Get over there in that crowd over there. <laughs> yeah. So they, they said, okay, Jimmy Vaughn. I r- ran out there and I mysteriously caught this pass. It was, yeah. a, it was an accident. Yeah. And they all piled on me and I brought my collarbone. That was it. And so they sent me home. I was home for three months. My dad came home from work and said, I don't know what we're going to do with you. He said, here, he gave me this guitar that he had gotten from a friend of his, had three strings on it. So I've been playing ever since. <laughs> since, since he had those three strings? <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I'll show you, if you hand me that damn guitar, I'll show you what I did. I don't know what that might be in an open tuning. I don't know. Check That's it okay. Out. Yeah, doesn't whatever. It doesn't matter yeah. because I only had three strings and yeah. I didn't know what to do. But I had a. I didn't know how to do it, so I went. That was what I learned the first day. That's all you need, and I'm still doing that. Yeah, yeah. I was so fucking excited when I learned how to do that. <laughs> it was backwards, but I did it anyway. But you know that that thing, that thing, and then you, and when you learn how to change to the A. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> it's so fucking exciting. So I still got that bug. Yeah, that's what drives me. I'm excited. I'm excited thinking about it <laughs> because I, I learned chords first. But when someone told taught me, I think it was honky tonk. Really, I was like, oh my god! And then it just ended there for me. That was that was. <laughs> Well, I still play that. Yeah. I still play it all night. Yeah. yeah. I love it. It's pretty satisfying, right? It's fabulous. When was it, What was the guy, like, when you were a kid, I mean, if that's the way it happened, who, what was the first blues song? What was the first thing that just you know, entered your head and, and, and didn't well, let was, go? There was a guy, uh, there was a radio station called WRR in Dallas that came on it. At 10 o'clock at night, I believe it was, played till midnight. Yeah. And they would play Jimmy Reed. Yeah. Lots of Jimmy Reed. Yeah, yeah. And they would play Lightning Hopkins and three or four guys. Yeah. So I would, I had a transistor radio, and you're supposed to go to bed at 10. You know, you can lay in the bed with the light out and click that transistor radio on, and you can just hear it if you put it to your right, ear. Right, stick it right up And it doesn't do anything to your head like nowadays. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't blast your ears out. Well, you know, nowadays it's... Oh the, yeah, it might the, be the, yeah. the whatever the yeah. satellite the beam. Sure, you know? <laughs> yeah, satellites making babies in your brain. Right. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was it. And then after t- at midnight, I would flip over to uh, XERF, which was uh, Wolfman Jack. Yeah. And then I learned after that I could get Nashville. Oh, you could get all the way out there because they were the big stations, you know. From Dallas, you could get it? At yeah. Late at night, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it could probably... And that was the Hulse Man and and all that stuff. Like, uh, what, just uh, country stuff? No. No, what, no was it was it? blues. It really? was a blues From show. Nashville? Yeah. All, all blues? Yeah. So you were like, what, like a kid? How old? 12, 13. And what's your brother doing? He was eight. Yeah. So, so not, he, he, not wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't there yet, but when I got a record player and started playing albums, he... I would, you know, try to play some song. I'd get a record and try to play it, put it down, and say, don't touch my guitar. Yeah. We had the same room, you know. Right. right. Then he would pick it up and as soon as I left and, and <laughs> play the same thing. So he, he basically started a little bit after I did, you know. Yeah. And did you take lessons? No. You never did? No. I, I tried to take lessons one time. My dad said, son, if you want to get good on that you're gonna have to learn your majors and your minors yeah so i went down to on jefferson in oak cliff uh to boyd's 
guitar school. Yeah. And uh, I went down there the first lesson. He gave me a couple of things, you know, notes and stuff. He said, I'm not going to tell you what this song is. I want you to learn the notes. Yeah. So I'll see you next week. Yeah. So I came back. After a couple of weeks, I, I finally figured out that it was... The melody was Mary Had a Little Lamb. Dun, yeah. dun, 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 dun. So I yeah. played that, and he goes, you're not reading that. And I said, well, look, what do you want me to do? You want me to read or play? I can't do both. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, he fired me after a couple of As a student, few he, lessons, he let yeah. you go? Yeah, I'm not going to teach you, kid. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> and what, when did you start? Like, uh, what'd you, what, what, was your, what business was your dad in? My dad was an asbestos worker. What they called a pipe coverer. Oh yeah, yeah. That's not not healthy. It's not real healthy. No, no. <laughs> you know they would insulate. He was called an insulator. Oh, okay. They would insulate pipes Just, on, on buildings, big buildings, oh, and and that was it. Before it was safe. Did yeah. He, and so he did. He get sick from yeah, that. He, he did. did. He died from the black lung. Oh yeah. And asbestosis. Yeah. Oh boy. But uh, you know that's um, there was a lot of musicians. In his local, in Dallas, uh, a lot of rock and roll guys, hillbilly guys, and all kinds of people were there because you could go and make a lot of money on a, a couple of weeks yeah, and then go off on tour or whatever. Yeah, anybody uh, that you knew? Uh, Record Well, guys? there was a guy named Leonard. I don't know his last name, but his name was Leonard, and he had a guitar. He had a big Gibson. Yeah. Like an L five or something with two pickups and his name in the neck and yeah. Pearl yeah. Leonard and he he told me I he came over to my house my parents would play dominoes on the weekends yeah so he came over there with another guy and they played in the living room while they were playing dominoes and I said uh, I like I like that blue stuff and he goes you mean like this so he he started playing Jimmy Reed he showed me how to play Jimmy Reed Chuck Berry and John Lee Hooker. In one night, oh, you need. He show me how it went. Yeah, right. Know. Sure. The yeah, what the chords were. And he had actually movement. played with Chuck Berry, like backed him up. You know. Oh yeah, a lot of people did. I think. Yeah. Right. Chuck would come into town and go, "Who's going to do it?" Right. Yeah. So he taught you those are three pretty essential things, man. It's unbelievable. I mean, that <laughs> God sent that guy there, you know, for me. <laughs> <laughs> you need that guy. He was great. And uh, how old were you when that happened? I was about 12, 13. I mean, I just started trying to play. So were there other people that taught you stuff? My I mean, uncles on both sides of my family. My uncle on my mom's side played guitar. They played in hillbilly bands and, and on my dad's side, too. So he was people. Like hillbilly know. bands? Yeah. Well, you know, like which a, was just country at the time. You sure. know, Mer Merle Travis, you know, they like Merle Travis and... Um, Hank Williams and you yeah, know sure. all that stuff. Yeah. And so but you know wh when I first started playing they I didn't know that there was a difference between it was just cool music I right. thought. Sure. I didn't know you know I heard uh, blues on the radio and you know BB King and and all that stuff Jimmy yeah. Reed and yeah. Chuck Berry. I had you know I had Chuck Berry records and then I met this harmonic player who was about 15 years older than me, he was a grown-up, and he yeah. he um, he gave me a, a, a little Walter album. Oh yeah, the, yeah, the best of little Walter. Sure, album. yeah. And then he then I found you know Muddy Waters and all that stuff. Yeah, so. the chess box. Yeah, but it wasn't a box. It, it was, was just the, the best. It was uh, a real album. Yeah, yeah, of, of of little Walter with Juke on it. Yes. Yeah, man, that thing that that's a life changer. And so, did you play harp at all? Well, no. I mean, I tried, but uh, but but you know, I never could play. And then I got uh, I met Kim Wilson, so I didn't really. That guy is sort of a, a savant. He's a he's he's a, a great harmonica. Player. Yeah, like he's just a gifted player. Yeah. So what? I, you know, where'd I, you meet I him? I stuck to the guitar. How old were you when you met him? Um. Well, I guess it was in the seventies. So. I was probably 19 or 20, something like that. And he was just around? No, he came down. He came to Austin, and I was already playing yeah. uh, down there. And he came to Austin and came to this place where I was playing and, and said, I want to sit in. And we said, okay. And he he got up and you know, he did the big Walter Horton, George Smith 
thing, you know, yeah. and tore it up. And so yeah. that was about it. two weeks later, we're like, well, we need to get a band. I think we'll call it the Fabulous Thunderbirds. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was like, yeah. He's in. So, you know, that's how we got started, basically. You know. But you grew up in Dallas, mostly? Yeah. But, I mean, I moved to Austin when I was 18. So yeah, yeah that was in 1969. Oh, wow. So, permanently. I had been playing there. I used to play in, when I was 15, I got in this band that was a a band that played fraternity parties, and they made a lot of money playing fraternity parties. Top 40 stuff? Yeah, anything. Beatles, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And uh, they were all 21, and I was 15. Yeah. And I got to stay out all weekend, you know? Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, so I was making uh, $300 a week. That's pretty good. For 68. In the 60s. Yeah. Le in the mid, mid to late 60s for a 15-year-old kid. Yeah. yeah. Better than football. A whole lot better. <laughs> and there was girls there. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get more girls with a guitar than football. Well, I don't know about that, but oh, it's a lot easier. I do. Unless you're like a, unless you're the, the quarterback. But see, the thing was, I didn't know how to play football. Right. I was terrible. I was the worst football player <laughs> in the know, world. I know. The guitar worked out better. So you're playing, you're doing $300 a week, you're 15 years old, did you do, did you just like quit school or did you stay in? I just or? ran off. Yeah, that was it? Yeah. Yeah, to Austin. Well, I, I went to Dallas first. I went downtown and I had gigs down there. I, we had we played a place called The Cellar Yeah. for a while and then- With uh, the fraternity band? No, that was a different band. I was in a band called The Chessmen. Yeah. Who I was telling you, the guys were 21, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we got a gig. We opened for uh, Hendrix. You did. When and this was when Hendrix came out, his first, like his first tour of the states. Yeah. So we played at SMU uh, in Dallas, other Southern Methodist University Auditorium for, in Dallas. Was, was was he popular at that point? Yeah, he was big. This is well, big, he yeah. was. You know, he was. It was a a big buzz. I mean, he filled up the. Yeah. 2,000 seats. I don't know how many. Yeah. You know, was, it was a small uh, auditorium. Was that the same tour that, that, that Billy opened for him with his Probably. That, with that first band of his? Moving Sidewalk. Moving Sidewalk. I'm, sure, yeah. I'm sure it was. Right. So what, what was your experience with Jimmy? Did he a nice guy? He was real nice, but I just remember, you know, when they came out, and I uh, just remember his his the licks he did when he... Came out to see if his guitar was working when he first put it on. Yeah. He just went. Yeah. It was like, but it was like five times that fast. Right. Yeah. You know, I can't even do it that fast. Right. But uh, you thought he was fabulous. I got some work to do. <laughs> well, I already knew that, but, but uh, yeah. he was Jimi Hendrix and I wasn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. But most of those licks were blues licks. Yeah. I mean, he was. He was he was fantastic. Yeah, he was. I always thought of Hendrix as, uh, uh, you know, he was like um, Muddy Waters' stepson who had just got back from his tour of Mars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that makes sense. When you when watching like somebody like Hendrix at that time, I can't imagine like because you play pretty straight in. You just go right into the amp for the most part, right? Yeah, like I just like the. Like to the the people then, he just like what he had one or two pedals and then just went right into the amp, just turned that thing out, right? It was yeah. kind of pure. It seemed more pure back. Well, they didn't then. have all that. That's stuff. That's right. Uh, and you it know, sounds you, better, if you, right? If you were in the studio, you you could have echo and right and uh, things. But basically, he had the he had the Univibe and he, he and he had a fuzz face, I think, something like that. And so he could the amps already all the way up. Yeah, and then the. Buzzface will give you a little more. Uh, I guess he was using it for the sustain and all that. Yeah. It was just everything all the way up. Yeah, right. So he could do the space travel. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, you know, he was he did, you know, the first time I found the first Hendrix record, there used to be a TV show in Dallas when yeah. I was a kid. I come off from school. It was called Something Else. And it had cheerleaders dancing and they would play records. It was one of those kind of deals. After school, mm -hmm. record party, dance show. Yeah. And I went over there and would go through the, the bin in the back, the trash bin, and they have other records they didn't like. 
in there. And I found Purple Haze, the 45. Yeah. Foxy, I think, uh, I forget what's on the other side, maybe Foxy, whatever it was. Yeah. And I brought it home and played it because I'd read it. I had seen his name in a little blurb somewhere. Yeah. And, and so that was the way I that was it? found Hendrix. In, yeah. the, in the garbage. In the garbage. They, they had been put out. Yeah. They decided that wasn't the kind of music that they were going to play for their people. And you were, and you were a teenager still. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. It was so exciting, you know. Well, what is it about Texas, man? Because, like, you know, I listen to you guys on those first two Fabulous Thunderbirds records. You know, that's a, that, those are real Texan records. Yeah. And those are those. That sound is very specific. And at that time, when I first heard, I'm like, "What the fuck is?" No one was playing blues like that. You, you know, it was a, it was, it, it almost. I think it almost happened at the same time as punk rock somewhere in that. Yeah, area. yeah. They called us. Uh, uh, what what they call us? Uh, blue punk or something uh-huh. like that. They were trying to think of what to do with trying us. Trying to market you. Yeah, and it all comes from a certain number of people that are specifically Texas. Well, you know, it, it came from everywhere, really. But, but, but in Texas, like T Bone Walker's from Texas. Yeah, he was the first guy to play the electric guitar on the blues. He's the guy. He's the guy. <laughs> He's so the he guy. came. From, he comes from Texas. Yeah. He goes, but everybody had to go to L.A. to get a record. Uh, not everybody, but there was guys in Houston and sure. guys in Dallas. But back in the day, are we talking? How far back? Before you? Thirties. Right. Okay. Thirty-five. Yeah. I think. T Bone made his first electric guitar record. All the all the licks are on those records. Every lick. That's before World War II. It's crazy. So if they were all think how heavy that is. It's, they and then all, right next to him was Gatemouth Brown, who was there's pictures of them playing together. So uh T Bone goes to LA, gets gigs, records. Yeah. Uh Gatemouth goes and takes when T Bone goes on tour. Gatemouth gets his gig yeah. at the whatever the place was, you know, out here. Yes, in, right yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where it spreads the Texas sound. And then, but some of them, you know, go. Uh, it's going on in Houston, and then the Mississippi guys go to Chicago. And right. You know how it is. You 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 find T Bone Walker. You find Chuck Berry. Somebody, and then you read the back of the album, and it says, "I like," you know. T Bone Walker and T Bone says, I like Charlie Christian. So you go get Charlie Christian. Charlie Christian leads you over here. You hear Jimmy Reed. Da da da. Ah. You go over here. You go over there. You just, it's on a reverse search. Yeah. Sure. Or, yeah. It's a rabbit hole. Just so I connect the dots. And so, you know, I'm still finding guys that I didn't know about. Really? Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's impossible. It's, it'll never end. Well, it, it's so exciting. They're, they're on record, though. You yeah. find them on, yeah. Yeah. And then there's, now there's young guys coming up that are, that are gonna, it's gonna be fine, let me tell you. The blues are gonna be fine? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen Gary Clark? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen him. You seen him in person? I've seen him, I saw him open for the Stones in San Diego. And that other guy, the, the, the guy who plays with him, the guy in the poncho. Yeah. What's his Zapata. name? Zapata. Zapata. He can play too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I think we're gonna be all right. Well, let me let me ask you about that. That when you were when you were coming up in Austin, when you kind of settled down after you opened for Hendrix, you were you were that was in Dallas, right? Yeah. With the, with the first band, but once you get to Austin and you're 18 years old, there's a scene there, right? Already in the 60s. No, there was only Bill Campbell and uh, who's that guy? He was a, he played similar to uh, Freddie King. Uh, he was uh, like that. He played great. And then there was. Uh, did you see Freddie King? Yeah, many, many, many times. Is I played with Freddie him? King. Yes. You did? Yeah. Wow, man, that's heavy. He was serious. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? Well, I mean, he was just like Albert King. He was big yeah. and and imposing and cool yeah. and just and loud and just badass. Is it interesting you listen to those earlier records just how like fluid he was and then later he just lay into like just riffs that that ran deeper somehow? I I never could understand how do these guys figure out what they're going to play cuz when you have their when you're a kid and you have their album, yeah. You you hear the beginning and all the stuff in the middle. How do they know how to solo and how do they know what they're going to play? Yeah. You know. Yeah. You mean in in the actual song? Yeah. Where, where they, how do they land that thing? Right. Yeah. I don't. I haven't figured it out. That's why I stay in the garage. That's. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> so I imagined myself one time, if I was in the room with all my favorite guys, Albert King, yeah. Buddy Guy, B.B. King, Freddie King, and they all played, and we did a roundy roundy, and it got to me, what was I going to do? <laughs> I'd be pretty much screwed. That's, so that's what you would think. That's where the, it starts off a pretty good fantasy. And then all of a sudden the pressure's on. Well, then you realize. Yeah. What the, <laughs> I'm not as good as I thought I was. Yeah. This, yeah. Uh, these guys. <laughs> so, I mean, that's well, then you have to ask yourself, what do I do? Yeah. You know, you can you take from all these guys. Yeah. And you learn from them and you emulate them. Yeah. But when it gets your turn, what are you going to do? Because you, you can't do what they did. That's right. Exactly. You have right. to you have to have your own voice. Yeah. You, and so a couple I, that, guys that could use that information. And that's <laughs> that's what I you know really worked on. Sure. Not that I don't You were conscious of it. Yeah, you were conscious of it and like I I you know I've listened to these guys, I know how to play like these guys, but it, to, in order to find my own groove, my own thing, you got to let it happen. I mean, you can't. You have to ask fight. yourself, what do I do? Yeah, you know. And what'd you come up with? I mean, I, well, I hear it on the record. Well, I mean, it. it your own personality will come out uh, right. eventually. <laughs> yeah. If you keep playing, <laughs> I think. I think you're right. Yeah. And it does. But I'm still trying to learn, and and it still changes. And uh, you know, five years ago, I probably didn't play what I play now exactly. And what? How do you, how do you feel that your playing's evolved? Well, I, I, it just changes. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you got to play what you want to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the idea. Yeah. So it it just sort of changes. You don't want to play the same thing over and over exactly. So now when you get up to Austin, you know, you're starting to play up there. And I imagine you're, Stevie's still at home in Dallas. Yeah. He Well, when, when I ran away from home, uh, my... Mother and dad sort of clamped down on uh, Stevie and said, you're not going to do what he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're going to do your schoolwork and you're going to, yeah. we're going to watch you. Yeah. So don't think about it. Right. And which just made him try harder. On the guitar. On the guitar. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, and so he came up, when he got out of high school, he came to Austin. Yeah. And you knew he was just down there doing it? Just yeah. down there. Yeah. Yeah. Working it out. Oh, yeah. Did you guys get along pretty well? Yeah. Yeah. So he came up after high school. So now the Vaughn brothers are in Austin. That sounds like trouble to me. That must have been trouble. Well, he he did pretty good right away. Um, started playing around. He got a band and and started playing gigs and uh, the Double Trouble band, or was it a different? It was band? Triple Threat. Uh, it was all. He had a, several different versions. You yeah, know. yeah. You Always know, pe- the three piece. People or come purpose? and no, people come and go. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's. It's it's not as much. Uh, you don't always get what you want. Like you you, you yeah. don't always you can't have who you want all the time. Sure. So you yeah. or or they won't play what you want or they want to do something else or yeah. you know what I mean. It's it it evolves and changes. Sure. And, yeah, yeah. You know. So after the you know the first couple of Thunderbirds records, like what what was your relationship? Those were on Tacoma, right? The first two, and then you you switch labels. You got you well went to Tacoma. Label? You know. They leased it to Chrysler's. Yeah. And then, you know. Right. Was there pressure to change the sound? Um, not really, because we started out so crazy, they didn't really know what to do. They wanted to, they wanted us, you know, like they had some ideas. Hey, man, we could be Blue Wave. <laughs> we're like, nah, it doesn't sound right. Yeah. Oh, know? so they were trying to wedge you in. <laughs> well, they wanted to figure out how to market us, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all we wanted to do was kind of play Jimmy Reed or Little Walter songs. Yeah, yeah. And they, you know, it it took a while to get going. Kim, Kim wrote a lot of songs. And, you know, we, we would come up with stuff. So that was that was helpful. And then, and then uh, Dave Edmonds produced that, what was that, third record or the fourth record? And then we, we uh, went and toured England. Yeah. Uh, Rockpile hired us to open their tour of England. Yeah. And uh, that's when we met Dave and uh, 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 Nick Lowe. Nick Lowe produced us first. Yeah. And he was great. That was that was one of our best records. Uh, Which record was that? Uh, I'm in the mood to tear it up. I don't know the name oh, of yeah, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. T-Bird Rhythm. T-Bird Rhythm was the name of it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you like working with him. Oh, yeah, he was he was great. He's a we good had, guy. I talked to that guy. We had a great time yeah. with him. Didn't and they then, cover? They did uh, Yeah, Ain't Nothing But Fine, 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 too. Yeah. That's your song, isn't it? Well, no, I was rocking Sydney. Rocking Sydney, right. We worked with Nick, and then we went on and did... It was a few years later that we worked with Dave. Yeah. And then... Uh, it, and that, it, that was tough enough. Right. And you, did you have... You had some hits, kind of, right? Tough Enough was our hit. Yeah. Yeah, tough enough. Yeah. Ain't that tough enough? Yeah. Dear down. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happened? Then you did another record? Or, like, well, we they... did, uh, I think we did 10 albums all together, Thunderbirds, something yeah. like that. And it's still kind of going along without you? Is it? Uh, yeah, Kim, they're still going. Yeah. And well, what happened was, um, this is my version. Yeah. Um, Against Kim's version, you mean? Well, I don't know what Kim's version is. Yeah. But what happened was is, uh, the record company, Epic Records, after Tough Enough, came to me and said, we want you. Stevie was hitting really hard. Yeah. And they said, we want you to do a Vaughn Brothers record. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Because my dad had talked about it since when I was a little kid. He would say, you know, somebody would come over the house and say, you boys, go get your guitar. Stevie had a toy guitar. Yeah. Go get your guitars and play a tune for so-and-so. Yeah. And then we would play a song, or I would play a song, and Stevie would yeah. pretend to play yeah. at first. And then the the person, the the guest would go, well, you guys are pretty good. Maybe you can make a record someday. Yeah. You know, so that sure. seed was planted yeah. uh, from and 12 years old. The two of you playing together. Right. Yeah. So, you know, Tony Martell from Epic Records said, we need to make a record on you guys. And they all wanted it. And when they want something, it means you you know it's a good thing when you they can, want it. Yeah, yeah, it's again. It's get better some than money. When, it's a lot better when they don't want it. Yeah, when they don't want it, you, there's no money, and they uh, you have to talk them into it, and they don't want to do it. No, it's better than it's better when more than one people want it. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I I just I wanted to do it, and Stevie wanted to do it. Stevie had just had a won a Grammy from uh, I think from his In Step record. Oh yeah, yeah. The th yeah, yeah, and the step. third record. I got it. Yeah, it? yeah. Up on the tight wire. Was it that yeah, one? Was yeah. that the one on there? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The sober record. So anyway, he was kind of hitting it pretty hard, and uh, everything was going along pretty good for him. And then the record company starts saying, "Hey, Tony Martell said, hey, we want Jimmy and Stevie to make a record together.'" And he he pushed it. It was really Tony Martell. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we said okay. And then it became fun, and we did it. Was and, it fun playing with them? Oh, it was fabulous. Do you guys? Did you guys have a, a sort of uh, you know sixth sense about how each other worked? Had you been playing together long enough? Oh yeah, we could. It was it was telepathic. <laughs> and, it's a good record. I loved hearing that record. It was sad that it came out after he passed, but it was well. Great. You know, we we had no idea what was going to happen. Of you course, know, of not. course not. Yeah. And so uh, we thought, well, we'll be able to tour, and uh, this will be fun. Mm. And the record company was excited about the record too. From yeah. all along, I remember we went and played it for them. They came over in New York. We were at uh, at uh, Hit Factory or wherever it was we were recording, and some of the guys came over from the label, the Big Shots, and we played them a couple of the tunes, and they were just like, "Well, that's a hit, and that's a hit." And we were like, "Yeah." <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then... Uh, what was on that record? Was it mostly original shit? Yeah. Yeah. You guys wrote it together? Uh, yes. Yeah. And uh, we did the White Boot. There was a couple of songs we didn't write, but most of them we did. Uh-huh. And then uh, and then, and, and then they... Like, when you were... Like, right after you finished it? And then we finished it, and then uh, Stevie had a gig in uh, Wisconsin with uh, Eric Clapton and all these people were going to be there. And he called me and he said, you got to come. Everybody's going to be here. Buddy guy's coming and everybody's coming. And that's when it happened. So, and that was a month. And the record was already scheduled. And uh, we, uh, you know, the first single was going to be Good Texan. Yeah. And and we got together with the record company and said, we can't put out Good Texan. It's too, it's silly under these circumstances, it's not going to. After he passed, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Because it was all, you know, it was 
a shock and it's tragic and Def- it's devastating. just you know, all that yeah. you know so you don't want to put out a comedy record right uh right it didn't feel right so so they put out TikTok which was kind of times ticking you know it was more yeah, yeah, a little heavy more heavy you yeah know? yeah how that and then it did all right though right yeah the record ended up selling really good but it wouldn't i think it would have sold better if had it, that not happened it, everything would have been better absolutely <laughs> had that not happened but i mean it was more of a it was such a shock yeah the whole thing you yeah know? And he just gotten it together, right? You know, he was like just, sober. He and, just got sober. And, yeah. Uh, and I only I I had three months. Oh, you just had three months when he got yeah. yeah. He got and sober. I thought you know what I thought. I don't know if I can talk about this on the radio, but sure I can. said, I said, well, I got three months. I said if I went out and really tied one on, nobody would blame me. <laughs> and then right after that, and I thought, no. Nope, uh, my mother, and then Stevie will come back and kill me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, it's funny is what they say is that like you know, it, like that the disease was looking for a reason. It was looking for a reason. <laughs> oh sure. man! Well, I'm glad you didn't. I'm glad I didn't too. It might, so you guys were both out there at the same time, just w- watching each other. You know, well, tear it down. He, he got sober first. Yeah. Well, he broke down a couple of times and went in the hospital and uh for the coke. Right? Just yeah, yeah. drinking and yeah. whatever. Yeah. And so he was in the hospital in London. So I called Eric and said, "Hey, my brother's down the street at so and so." He went over and visited him. Eric yeah, Clapton did, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's he planted the seed. <laughs> that's what did it. Yeah. And then uh then Stevie got so I went to treatment, got sober, and then, um, you know, he had a, two or three years more than me. Uh huh. And I we would be on tour, and he would be all sober, and they would be in their room, and they yeah. would have cokes and yeah. iced tea, <laughs> yeah. and I'd be standing across the hall with my screwdriver that was about this tall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'd be like, "Would you like one? Come on over." <laughs> oh, you're like the devil oh, over there. I was. <laughs> Yeah, still having a good but time. But I was at that point where I couldn't imagine life with it or without it. You yeah. know what I mean? Waking up shaking and shit. Yeah, yeah. It's that's that's that's. And everybody, when I quit, when yeah. I quit drinking, everybody was like, "Man, we are so glad." Nobody said, "Come on, man, start drinking again." Right. <laughs> yeah, you were the, you were not the life of the party. No, no. So, what's your set list like when you do a when you're opening for Clapton? What do you what do you run through? Um, you change it up. Yeah, yeah. We well, we pretty much just we we get out there and play blues, and yeah. we do we do a couple of um, things off of you know each record. Yeah, yeah. But not with any. It's not like we have a radio hit now that everybody wants to hear exactly. Sure. So, uh, you know, we just go out there and have a good time, really. Yeah, yeah. You playing some of the original stuff or mostly covers? What are you doing? Mostly covers, but but yes, some original. Yeah, are you putting out a record? I got a, a organ trio record coming out with Mike Flanagan. Yeah, on the B three, and George Rains on the drums. Did you self release it? No, it's on proper okay. from from England. Oh, cool! They're going to do vinyl. Yes. Great. Then I'll I'll take it. I'll take one of those vinyls. And, and it's on uh, you know it's on all those digital things too. Man. You want you want to try and play a song? Sure. All right. Well, I mean, you, you're going to get to jam on this too. <laughs> okay. It's just got some lyrics. All right. Um, so, go for it. Let's do a uh, roll, roll, roll. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You go ahead. B flat. E flat or B flat? B flat. Okay. Guitar Junior, the great Guitar Junior. We're gonna cheer up the living, gonna wake up the dead. Midnight girl, we're gonna paint this town red. We're gonna roll. We're 
get a roll 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 all night long We're gonna pull back the road We're gonna kick up the floor Midnight girl, we're gonna boogie some more That was a tune by uh, Guitar Junior from Louisiana, who, who we all know now as Lonnie Brooks. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for hanging out, man. I that really was had a good great. time. Thank you. I loved it. Thanks, man. There you go. There you go. Me and Jimmy Vaughn. And don't forget, folks, cash is easy to lose and checks take a while to clear. Thankfully, there's Zell. A new way to send money to your friends and family from your banking app. Once you're enrolled, the money moves right between almost any U.S. bank accounts and typically arrives in minutes. Plus, it's backed by major banks, which means you can send money confidently. Just go to ZellPay.com, Z-E-L-L-E-P-A-Y.com to learn more. Zell, this is how money moves. All right, so uh, I think we're okay with music. So just please be careful this weekend. Try to be kind to yourself, kind to other people. Reflect on what uh, what you what you can do better, and how you can uh, be there for others. All right. And if you, you you can fight a little, you can fight a little. Happy Thanksgiving. Boomer lives. <laughs>